Hey, this is Leo for actualized.org. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about how to be funny, the psychology of humor. What I want to give you here is a very practical guide for how to up your humor, especially for guys who are very logical and very analytical and very serious minded. They have a serious minded attitude towards life because I was personally that way not too long ago. And I underwent a journey of my own to transform that. And the reason I did that was because it was necessary for me to get better results with attracting girls. In this episode, what you're going to get is you're going to get a bit of a bit of my backstory. You're going to get some theory about what funniness is, how humor actually works. We're going to take a look at your own psychology and what within your own psychology is holding you back from being more humorous naturally. And then I'm going to give you various categories of humor, lots of specific examples from my own life of how I used humor. And I'm going to give you three powerful exercises that you can use to actually drill this into your mind. So we have a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. Why is humor important? Well, it might seem self-evident, but there are actually more factors than you might initially think. I think the most important factor is that it helps you, if you're a man, to attract girls. Now here, I'm going to kind of be assuming that I'm dealing with a male audience and that you're trying to use this humor to be more likable, especially with girls. Although the principles that I talk about here could be used by anyone in any context. This is not just for in the nightclub or on a date or with your girlfriend. You can use this if you're a girl. You can use this in business context. You can use it everywhere. This is a very flexible skill. But uh, especially with girls, it's just a killer skill. Killer skill. Another important area where it's going to be great for you is just with socializing being friendly and being friendly in different contexts. So it could be with friends when you're just drinking beers at the bar, or it could be in a work environment. It could be in a social networking environment. It could be in a professional environment. Doesn't matter where. This is a very powerful skill. You can use humor to build really deep connections, to really open doors that would otherwise never be open for you. You can use humor as a way to manipulate people. You can use humor to really get your way in life where otherwise you wouldn't get your way. So very powerful. Um, humor is also very powerful if you're in sales or if you're in marketing. If there's stuff you got to sell, if there's a presentation you got to give, if you got to convince someone of something, it's a lot easier to get your way when you're humorous about it and when people like you. And perhaps the most important reason, which nobody really thinks about, is simply your own happiness and well-being. If you're a person who's going through life and you're dead serious all the time, the way that I was, and you have a, a stick up your ass, the way that I did, and you're afraid to socialize with people, and you've got four or five layers of mental filters for every sentence that you speak from your mouth. That means before a sentence can come out, you filter it four times to make sure that it doesn't upset someone or that it, it's not embarrassing or weird or you're not going to get judged for it. If you've got all this going on, you're actually not happy on the inside because you feel like your authentic self isn't allowed to flourish. In fact, this might be such a bad state for you, like it was for me, that you don't even know that this is going on for you. And you might have developed this kind of uh, uh, stigma where you tell yourself like, oh, well, I'm just not a very humorous person. My whole life, people have told me that I'm kind of dry and I'm kind of boring and maybe I'm a nerd and all this kind of stuff. And you feel like, well, Leo, can you help me? Can you help that type of person? And my answer is, yes, I can, because that's exactly who I was and still am. I'm a really nerdy person. So, you're going to get some really powerful ideas here. Um, here's the number one trick, the big picture of what you got to do to become funny, is you have to start to change the entire lens through which you see the world. 
right now, if you've got a bad sense of humor, it's because you're looking at the world through this lens where everything is dead serious and everything is very analytical, logical, and pragmatic. So that means whenever you move your lips, it's to get something utilitarian across to somebody else. Like, hey, can you go get me my car? Or can you loan me some money? Or can you do this thing at work? It's just very dry, matter-of-fact type of conversation, which leaves no room for funniness. You can't get funniness that way. And the chances are that you've been doing this for so long, you've been looking at life through this filter of seriousness for many years, maybe several decades now, that it's going to be very difficult for you to shift out of this and to reach this tipping point where your lens moves away, the serious lens moves away, and then a new lens comes into focus, which is the lens of looking at life and seeing humor and absurdity and silliness in almost every situation, no matter how mundane it is. That's the big picture key. Now, the question is, how do you actually do this? And what you're going to discover, if you're an analytical person the way that I was, you're kind of shy, you're very logical, very serious, that it's going to be quite challenging to do this shift in lenses. That's going to be difficult. But it's necessary because until you get this shift, what I found in my own life personally is that it's very difficult for you to be humorous and you try too hard at it and basically you're too anxious about it and it kind of backfires on you. So it's very important, I would say, that you make the flip happen. Make this shift happen in your lenses. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. But it's going to take some effort from you. You're not going to do it just by finishing this one episode. You're going to have to do some practice to follow this up. And not just a week of practice, not just a month of practice, but at least 12 months or more of practice. But think of it this way. You got to really ask yourself, how badly do you want this skill of being funny? How valuable is it to you? Now, you might think about it like, well, being funny, you know, uh, there's a lot of other stuff in my life that I could put my attention and energy into. 12 months of practice, you know, uh, wouldn't it be better to just put that into my job or into my career, into my relationship, something like that? And I would say, hold on a minute. Maybe you're looking at this from the wrong perspective. Maybe actually being funny is a really critical and key skill in life for you. I would suggest that it is, if you really think about all the ramifications that it could have if you just develop this skill. You're going to really be much better at attracting women. You're going to be much better socially. You're going to be much more comfortable socially. You're going to be able to make business connections that you otherwise would never have been able to make. You're going to be better at sales. You're going to be happier on the inside. So there's a lot of benefits. You're going to be able to get your way in life more easily. Uh, so is that worth the investment? I kind of need to convince you that it is, because otherwise you're not going to do the work to get the shift to make it effortless, right? Humor is supposed to be effortless. And that's kind of what I experienced in my own life is about uh, three or four years ago, I decided that, hey, uh, you know, I've been very antisocial my whole life. In high school and in college, I didn't really interact with people much at all. I was very focused on work. I was very focused on my academics, on my grades, and I was really good at that. And I was very much in my head and I played a lot of video games and that's where I was. And unfortunately, after eight years of that, high school and college, I was kind of left uh, socially inept, unable to date, unable to be friendly with guys at the bar. And um, this was a problem for me, right? Big problem. Um, by the way, before I forget, there's an important point I wanted to make about why this skill is so important for you. If you're a man, having humor is very important for you, much more so than it is for women. Not only because you can attract women with it, but actually because you can use it as a form of power. It's a way to manipulate. And if you want to be a powerful leader, you need to have a sense of humor. It's very difficult to be a powerful leader if you have no charisma and if you're just very dry all the time and you can't make a joke to save your life. Uh, it's very hard to follow that kind of person into battle. Great leaders are usually pretty good at making jokes. And in fact, they're so strategic about making jokes 
and little quips and zingers that they can put other people into their place. They can establish status. Their higher status is, assen is essentially established through humor, which is, I think, one of the deep evolutionary reasons why women are attracted to men who are humorous. Not simply because they can make the woman feel good. I mean, that's certainly a plus. But because it shows that a man who is so confident socially, um, he has social power and he has social status. And that's something that women find very attractive. So anyways, back to my story, right? So I was this very socially inept guy after college. And uh, after a while, basically, I had to say, okay, I got to fix this problem. And um, I started getting into the dating scene and I started learning about how dating works. And I got involved with pickup for a few years and I went pretty hardcore with pickup and just learned a lot of theory and tried a lot of different stuff and um, got a lot of insights. But basically what happened for me is eventually I was able to reach this point. At first it was very challenging, but eventually I reached the point where my analytical lenses and my serious lens, it all kind of melted away and I could start to see humor effortlessly in every situation. And um, I've been very well served by that. And there's still more growth that I can do there, but um, that's really something that I want for you here. So I want to share how you can do that for yourself. So how do we do that for you? Well, basically what we need to do is we need to unwire your logical, serious attitude. We need to make you more emotional and more spontaneous, less controlling of yourself, less self-conscious. We also need to give you a more relaxed internal state. You cannot be humorous from an anxious place. You're not going to be very humorous if you're depressed, if you're angry all the time, if you hate your life. So one of the deeper fixes for this is to actually go improve your life so that you're happier in your life. Happy people will naturally say funny, happier things, right? Uh, if you're seriously depressed, you're probably... <laughs> uh, these, these little tricks that I give you here might not be enough to fix you. You might need to fix the depression first before you do that. So you're relaxed. Also, if you're, for example, talking to a girl and you're trying to say humorous things to a girl, you're going to find that you're going to um, lose all your humor abilities if you're talking to a girl and you're nervous to her because like, you feel like, oh my God, she's this hot girl, I need to impress her, and all that kind of stuff. If you have this approach anxiety, as they call it. It's going to be very, very hard for you to be humorous because in that anxious state, you're not relaxed enough to let the spontaneous humor come through. And humor, the best kind, is spontaneous. It's not canned material. All the stuff I'm going to be uh, sharing with you here, these are going to be like a skill set that you develop. So you're not going to be using canned lines or funny jokes that you read on the internet somewhere. I'm talking about the real skill of being humorous, which is completely flexible and adaptable and works in every situation. For that to happen, we need to also remove your verbal filters. This is hard to believe, but you have many layers of verbal filtering going on all the time, which prevent you from saying the things that you really think. And this makes you non-humorous. This is very natural because we've li we live in a society, and probably you grew up in a family where there were certain things that you weren't allowed to say, certain things that would offend other people, certain things that were politically incorrect, or sacrilegious, or whatever. Maybe you even got slapped for saying something you shouldn't when you were a kid, and now basically you've got all this filtering going on, which prevents you from being authentic, prevents you from just being blunt, and it prevents you from being goofy. And that's another thing we need to work on, is your willingness to be goofy, right? So some guys, one of the problems that they have, and something that I had, is that like, you walk into the club, and you're going to have fun with girls here, and you're maybe you're going to try to pick a girl up or something, you're going to say something funny. But you walk in there with this kind of attitude like you're James Bond, like you're this cool, suave, sophisticated, untouchable, uh, uh, like very masculine kind of dude, and you have no smile on your face, you're kind of robotic, and you think that that's what girls are into, and you think that you can be humorous from that kind of place. But actually, you can't. The best place to be humorous from is a goofy place. Imagine your body being all loose, like a monkey. Uh, imagine a big grin on your face. Imagine weird facial expressions. Imagine looking silly. Imagine people looking at you and thinking that you're a, a total goofball clown. You have to be, get comfortable with that image, right? 
because that involves you being judged. That means that there could be situations where you might do something embarrassing or shameful or stupid, look silly, and you have to be okay with that. And that's something you have to kind of work through in your mind, right? To be okay with that. Everyone has a unique and natural sense of humor. This is what I've discovered. I thought that like, well, maybe some people are more humorous than others. And while it's probably true that some people are naturally a little more humorous than others, I think we all have a sense of humor. The problem is that most people have been kind of beaten down by society and told no so many times, and we've been so serious and analytical for our whole lives that we've lost touch with it. So if you feel like you don't have a natural sense of humor, I would, I would just caution you not to jump to a conclusion there and to limit yourself with that belief. Leave the possibility open that maybe, in fact, even though right now you're kind of a nerd and you're analytical and you don't think that you're funny and there's no history of you being funny in the past, leave the possibility open that you could actually develop into a really humorous individual. That's what I found I was able to do in my own life. It's really hard for you to believe like it was for me, that fear could be stifling you so much that you have lost touch with your sense of humor, your natural sense of humor. It seems like, yes, Leo, I mean, I could be afraid of certain things in social situations, but am I really so afraid that like, I'm not this like super witty, super uproariously funny guy? And the answer is yes. That's what I found, is that actually, yes, that's the case. If we totally loosen you up, like if we took you out for a night on the town and it was just like fun and rambunctiousness for uh, eight hours straight and we got you drunk and um, we just got you to do silly things and we were doing it in this very social context where everyone was approving of you and everyone was cheering you on, what would happen is that you would be extremely humorous by the end of that night. Simply because you have put yourself into such a emotionally... Uh, playful place by the end of the night that just like brilliant like you will be more hilarious than a stand-up comedian it's quite shocking and you can actually test this out and see that this will be true but you know you can't always go through that kind of process so we're going to talk about some details now about the structure of humor what is humor really why do people laugh this is actually a pretty deep question and Thinkers throughout history, philosophers, in fact, have actually asked this question since the Greeks and Romans, the, the ancients. And they've wondered, like, you know, what makes people laugh? It's a pretty interesting phenomenon because, as far as I'm aware, no other animal in the animal kingdom laughs. Pretty interesting. So why do humans laugh? And one prevailing theory that I like is that the reason humans laugh is because it releases tension, which is built up right throughout the execution of the joke or whatever the funny situation is. So laughing is like a, a release of tension. And it's really interesting because laughing is not a conscious behavior, it's an unconscious behavior. We can't really control what's funny to us and what's not. It just happens automatically. That's one of the beautiful things about laughter is that you can just let yourself go and laugh and have a great time. But more practically, how do we create humor? The way we create humor is by setting up a situation where something unexpected or jarring happens. This is how all humor works. So there's a certain situation or context or someone is delivering some lines to you of words and you're kind of expecting one thing, you're kind of being taken in one direction, and then in the split second, there's the punchline, and there's this kind of reversal in expectations, and it's like, oh, it's not what I was thinking, and it becomes funny to you, and you start to laugh to release tension that was built up in that situation. So that's basically how all humor works. Now, there's lots of different specific categories of humor, and I want to cover some of the basics here, and I want to give you examples. So, I'm going to give you examples across all these categories from my own personal life. So, these were some of the most funny moments that I can remember. And I mean, I've said a lot of funny shit going out a lot. I've, I've gone to a lot of nightclubs, spent a lot of nights going out. And some nights, um, you know, were just terrible. I was just awful. 
But then some of the stuff I said was just like pure gold. So I'm going to give you some examples of that here. All right, so the first category is what I call ridiculous scenarios. What this means is that basically you come up with a ridiculous scenario and you verbalize it to the person or group of people that you're talking to. And you can really take it to ridiculous proportions. In fact, the more ridiculous, the more unexpected it is, the more jarring it is, and the more funny it is. So what are some examples of this? And by the way, this is one of my favorite categories because I think it's one of the easiest ones to work with. So uh, one time I remember I was uh, in a club and uh, I saw this girl and I was just in such a good mood. I walked up to her and I just immediately started talking about something like this. I said, hey, you know, we would have the most amazing children together. In fact, if we had a baby girl, I would tell her that she should become a porn star or a stripper because she would just be beautiful. She'd be the most beautiful girl in the world. We would want to make her a porn star. And if we had a baby boy, he would be an ass model on the cover of magazines, known all over the world for his beautiful ass. So that's an example for you right there. And then I just kept kind of going with it and making it more and more ridiculous. So as you can see in this example, I start off kind of plausible. It's like we would have amazing kids. And that's, that's already a little bit presumptuous of me to say that to someone I just met, random stranger. But then I just take it to ridiculous levels. And it becomes ridiculous, especially when I start talking about how a girl is going to become a porn star, right? Why is this funny? Because usually when parents have a child and the child is beautiful and it's a girl, it's like they think that it's uh, this little angel that they have and they want her to be everything except a porn star. So how funny would it be if <laughs> the parents actually wanted her to become a porn star? That would be hilarious. So basically, that's kind of the the expectation that I was playing against in that example. Here's another example, and this is a slight twist on ridiculous scenarios, and this is giving a ridiculous compliment. So let's say you're a guy and you're talking to a girl and you want to compliment her. Usually guys would give a, a corny compliment like, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. No, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's very chumpy. Instead, give her a compliment like this, and this is one that I used, and I got a really good reaction one time. I said, oh my god, you are the cutest thing ever. You are cuter than a baby polar bear sliding down a rainbow into a pot of gold over an emerald green pasture with a unicorn in the background covered in rainbow sprinkles. So that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, but uh, the point behind that example is that it's a compliment, but at the same time, it's just so ridiculous and over the top and every additional thing I say is just even more ridiculous than the previous thing. And it's just, uh, you know, uh, you can't keep a straight face even just saying that, that line. It's hilarious. So um, actually, when I said that to this girl, she, uh, she was laughing so hard. She had, to, instead of talking to me, she actually ran off to grab her friend. And she brought her girlfriend over and asked me to repeat the compliment to her girlfriend. <laughs> because it, she thought it was so funny. So, um, you know, there you go. Just uh, an example right there. Uh, another example, and this is also a slight twist, is in more ordinary situations, let's say you're not at the club. More calm, chill situation. Maybe, for example, you're with your girlfriend or even with your wife, and you want to be a little funny with her. What do you do? Well, one time I was walking down an aisle at Whole Foods, and I saw these really ugly yoga pants. You know those yoga pants that they sell at those um, organic food markets? So I saw some of those yoga pants there, and this particular one just had this awful pattern on it, just totally hideous. Uh, no one would ever want to be seen with this. So I texted the girl that I was seeing at the time, and I said something like, <laughs> I said something like, um, oh, I found you the perfect pair of pants. And then I texted her a picture of those pants. So again, it was ridiculousness being played out right? So I actually take my time to look for the ridiculous around me as I'm sitting somewhere, if I'm bored, if I'm on a cell phone, if I'm walking through the supermarket, if I'm in a club, if I'm looking at a girl. This is where I'm talking about, again, training your filter to look for the ridiculous in the mundane. And this, uh, this takes a bit of practice. What's cool about it is you can literally train yourself by looking around you wherever you are, and find something ridiculous about the situation. Also, what you can do is you can just 
concoct ridiculous situations out of thin air, right? So it doesn't have to be handed to you on a silver platter. You can just literally come up with ridiculous situations just by, like, uh, literally, um, it's just like fantasy. You just come up and just keep adding more and more and more and more to it. Kind of like I was doing with the, the baby polar bear sliding down the rainbow and just kind of adding more and more crap to it. And it just became funny after a while. Okay, so the next category is role-playing. This is a powerful category. What you do is you assume a role as though you're an actor. And then you pick a funny role for yourself that you're going to play. So two favorite roles that I have that I like to play is uh, the, gar the arrogant asshole or the arrogant king and the diva. So the arrogant king is, is a favorite of mine. So basically, you walk into the place and you act as though everything that comes out of your mouth is as though you're the king or tyrant of this establishment. So here's an example of how this would go. Let's say I'm in a club. That means I walk in and I'm a very cocky. I hold this very cocky, regal pose. And I walk up to people and I kind of expect them to initiate conversations with me and kiss my hand as though I'm this king, right? Like they really respect me. And then let's say a girl starts talking to me and I'm, I'm talking to her and I'm listening to her. And then when she's done talking, I would say, very well, you have done well, my subject. You have earned the privilege to feed me grapes at dinner time as naked women fan me with palm fronds from this uh, uh, scorching heat that we're in. So something like this, right? You kind of act like you're this king and like it's very cocky and arrogant, but you do it in this way where it's pretty obvious to people that you're acting. And um, that can be funny. You can also play the diva. So a lot of times girls will play divas, especially hot girls. They uh, want everything done for them. And they, they expect everything the best, you know. They expect the best luxuries and they expect you to treat them nicely and all this kind of stuff. And it's like nothing is ever good enough for them. So you can take on that role yourself and actually preempt the girl. So if you're with a hot girl and you're a guy... One thing you can do is you can act the diva and everything she does, like it's not good enough for you. And it's like, no, I want it better. I want it faster. I want it bigger, you know, <laughs> like this, like you're, you're not satisfied with anything. Um, but you do it in a playful way, not in a critical way. And so that can be a fun role. Those are just two roles. You can come up with many other types of funny roles. Um, and uh, what's cool about roles is that not only are you kind of like making other people laugh, but most importantly and primary is that you're making yourself laugh in this role. It's almost as though you're being a rascal and you're playing pranks on people. You're just kind of walking around and you're playing this role and other people don't even know that you think that you're this king. But in your mind, you know, just for this next 30 minutes, you're just going to be pretending and it's just kind of funny to you how people react. So um, that can be a cool one. Another category of humor is self-deprecating humor. This is a classic one, and it can be really powerful. I've got a really good example for this from my own life. So one time, my buddy and I, we went to the Spearmint Rhino, which is like a world-class strip club here in Las Vegas where I live. And uh, we went there, and we were just kind of hitting on the girls, and it was a slow Tuesday night, and we were cheap. We didn't really want to pay for lap dances. So we would sit there, and girls would come and sit on our laps and just kind of talk to us, try to get us to buy lap dances. But we were just kind of screwing around. So I kind of just decided to see how far I could take it with a girl and just kind of attract her, you know, try to attract a stripper without paying her anything. And so I'm, you know, sitting there thinking like, what can I say to make her laugh? Uh, and then, and I was thinking like, well, guys always come here and try to impress these strippers because these strippers are just like gorgeous. Spearmint Rhino has some of the most gorgeous strippers you'll, you'll find in the world. And, uh, and then it hit me and I'm like, oh, I know exactly the right the right thing to say. So she comes over, she, this Asian girl comes sits over on my lap. She's a beautiful girl. And, um, and I ask her, so, uh, you like guys with tiny penises, right? Like guys with really small dicks. And she's like looking at me and she's kind of like, what? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm this guy, um, who has a really tiny dick and I think you would really love me. Tell me something. Do you have a boyfriend? And she's like, Yeah. And I'm like, I, you know, I, I bet your boyfriend is like one of those macho guys who like goes to the gym, has these huge biceps and stuff. You know, I don't have huge biceps. And uh, and I bet your, your boyfriend, he has this huge, massive dick. Because I know how much you strippers love massive dicks. But 
have you ever considered dating a guy with a tiny dick? Like, don't you ever get tired of getting banged by guys with giant dicks? Like, I mean, it's fun at first, but then after a while, I imagine that it gets kind of boring, kind of annoying, in fact, right? Wouldn't you like to meet a guy with like a, a tiny micro penis? Like a little, a little nub of a penis, like a half incher. Well, that's what you got right here with me. Girl, you don't know what you're missing out on. And so I, I just keep going with this. And so I'm basically combining self-deprecation and ridiculousness. And I'm just kind of like ramping this up. Uh, <laughs> by the time I was done with that, she was just laughing her ass off. And she sat there with me on my lap for like 40 minutes just talking to me after that. Because it was so hilarious and it demonstrated so much confidence for me. Here's the trick with self-deprecating humor. If you're going to use it, go really over the top with it. Because if you do a little a little weak self-deprecating humor, then people might think like you're insecure about yourself. But when you do really obnoxious, over-the-top self-deprecating humor, it's so hilarious that actually it makes you hyper-confident. Because think about it from the girl's perspective. She's kind of expecting that this guy, he comes here, he's not very attractive, he probably wants to impress her with how cool his car is or how much money he makes or, or how much business he does or something like that how muscular he is, uh, and, you know, how masculine he is. So that's what she expects. Now, when I come in there and I start telling her all, you know, the things about my tiny dick, like, to her, that's completely out of her reality. That's completely against everything she expected. And that makes her laugh a lot. Um, and it shows that I'm very confident because I could sit there with a straight face and talk about my tiny dick, which is what nobody would ever think of doing in a place like a strip club. So that's what made it work. So try that. Uh, another category is blunt social commentary. I'll give you an example of this. <sighs> last, uh, last spring, I was at a meditation retreat and it was like this very intense four day workshop where we did a lot of uh, very like deep soul searching work or meditation and enlightenment. And, um, you know, we shared a lot of our deep histories and stuff about ourselves and our emotions. And then at the end of that whole thing, we were sitting in a circle on the last day and we were trying to just um, wrap everything up. And what was interesting about that situation is that we weren't allowed to talk other than doing those exercises. So really, we knew nothing about each other. We didn't even know our names and we didn't know, like, where we're from or where we worked or anything about ourselves. So in a sense, we kind of shared our hearts and we spilled out a lot of private intimate details. But on the other hand, we kind of didn't even know the most basic things about each other. So we were sitting in that circle and we were about to all leave. We flew in from different parts of the country. Uh, and one of the women there, she just says, oh, you know, uh, I would really like to know a little bit more about everybody here. So why don't we just go in a circle and uh, everyone say their name and say where they're from and maybe a sentence or two about what they do. And she said all that, kind of like offering it as a suggestion to us. And I sat there and immediately in my mind, the funny thing popped in because I was looking for funny and my mind found the funny. And what it found funny was that I said this, I said, you know, I think we should just treat this whole thing as a nice one night stand. So we don't uh, want to spoil it by knowing too much about each other. And when I said that, the whole room just uh, lit up in uproarious laughter. And they laughed for a good 20 seconds. Like it was, it was really contagious laughter. And the reason that worked, because there was this, this jarring juxtaposition of this kind of like very green, very hippie environment that we were in. We were sitting there very quietly meditating and stuff like that. And everyone was very respectful and loving of everybody. And here I bring sex into the situation. I bring a one, I, you know, a cheap, dirty one night stand into the situation. I kind of, I juxtapose those two together. Um, and also, it was like an authentic social commentary, very subtly, because in a sense, what was special about this workshop we went through is that we didn't really know each other. That's what made it good. We were kind of like strangers. And that's what makes a one night stand good is like we're kind of like strangers, right? So it was kind of true that people didn't really want to give out their names and all their personal details to fill in all the blanks. We kind of liked leaving it open and leaving the mystery there. So that got a lot of people laughing. And actually, my filter was on even more. And what I, what I caught on to is that 
some people were actually laughing so hard that it it's like in my mind, it's like, oh, those people really know what I talk about, what I'm what I'm talking about here with a one night stand. And it was so funny because I could have immediately said, and I didn't say this, but I could have said this. It's like, wait a minute, some of you are laughing way too hard at that joke, implying that they had a lot of one night stands when they were younger. Because this was this was also a group of like 50 and 60 year olds, right? So um they usually don't talk about sex and one night stands that much. So it was a really funny situation that I could have made even more funny if I wanted to, because my filter was open and I was looking for the funny. And that's what I want you to kind of learn from this example is like, if your mind is open and it's looking for the funny, it will find the funny. You just need to release your filters and you also need to train your mind to look for funny. And at first that's difficult, but once you get it, it's really worth it and it becomes effortless. That's, by the way, how that funny friend that you have in class or that funny friend you have at work that's so charming and it seems like humor is so effortless to him. How does he do it? Exactly this way. He didn't train himself. He probably did it just spontaneously. But basically, he learned how to change his filter to always look for the funny and not to then um, hold himself back from saying it and just blurting it out. Let's give you some more examples. So, uh... Next category is random nonsense. I love this category. You can literally just say random, complete nonsense to people, and they will start laughing. For example, I've walked up to girls and just opened with, uh, I have the most amazing semen in the world. You would love my semen. And I just say that with a straight face. Uh, and it's hilarious. They start laughing and giggling because it's just such random, it's just complete random nonsense. And I just, again, I, I make it ridiculous by going over the top with it. Um... I remember one time two girls were sitting at a bar and I was feeling a really great playful mood. So I just walk up to them. I just started the conversation with, hey, what do you girls think about glory holes? I need your opinion on glory holes. And I just started asking them about glory holes out of the blue. And it's like it's the most ridiculous, the most nonsensical conversation starter ever. And it works beautifully. So this especially works well when you completely, completely remove all your filters. This is also, by the way, why when you're uh, when you're drunk, you can be very humorous because your filters are removed by the alcohol. And by the way, everything I'm talking about here was said when I was completely sober. I never drink. And in fact, in all the hundreds of nights that I went out to clubs um, talking to girls, I virtually never drank. So this shit was said <laughs> totally sober. In fact, some of the things I said were so ridiculous that Girls would just assume that I'm drunk when in fact I'm not, which makes it even more funny to me. The girls don't know it, but to me, it's even more funny. Um, okay, let's move on to the next category. The next category is play on words. So if you're somewhat of a wordsmith and you have good grasp of the English language or whatever language you're doing your humor in, you can make play on words. And the English language is really great for this. So if you have a strong verbal skill, then this is one route you might want to go. What's an example of this? Well, let's say that a girl is telling me something funny and I want to tell her something like, hey, you're just absolutely ridiculous. Instead of saying you're absolutely ridiculous, I would say something quirky like you're absolutely redonkulous. Like you're a ridiculous donkey. You're so ridiculous that you're redonkulous. Something like that. And um, there could be a, a million other examples that uh, aren't coming to mind for me right now, but you get the idea with that one. Uh, the next category is breaking expectations. And while I already said that breaking expectations is kind of the common thread between all humor, here I mean a very specific thing. I'll give you two examples to illustrate this, both of them with, with girls uh, that I was kind of dating. So I was dating this one girl and I was seeing her and we were having sex multiple times. And then it got to this point where it was almost like she was getting this feeling that I'm kind of like using her for sex. And so she came to me one, one time at my... Uh, hotel room and she's sitting there on my bed and she's kind of a little bit annoyed with me and she's she's kind of telling me something so so leo you're like you're using me like i'm just like your little slut you're using me like a little slut and then she was kind of waiting for a response from me and immediately my mind saw the funny in this and the funny was that she was so expecting me to go against that and to start defending myself like no baby i don't think you're a slut you're, you're my little princess. I'm going to treat you right. Like she was expecting that from me. 
So what I do, you know, I decided to go completely against the grain on that one. So she tells me, you're just treating me like a little slut. And I said, yeah, pretty much. With a little cheeky smile on my face. And her jaw just like, oh, her jaw just drops. Like, it's shocking, right? Because it's pretty, pretty blunt. It's, it's shocking, but it's also hilarious. So then she starts laughing about it. And we both start laughing about it. It's just funny. It also kind of diffuses the situation. So that's one example of breaking expectations. Uh, another one, also with a girl that I was sleeping with, we were actually kind of lying in bed in the morning and uh, we were just kind of like talking bullshit, you know, the, the way that you do. And um, somehow we got on this topic of what would happen if a bear attacked her and I would have to come in there and, and rescue her. And so she tells me something like, well, so if a bear attacked me, then you would come in there and rescue me. And then she expects me to kind of chime in there and... and confirm it and say, yeah, you know, I would, I would be your valiant, uh, knight in shining armor. I would come in there and I would beat down this bear and save this damsel in distress. That's what she was expecting me to say. But I saw that and my mind's like, oh, don't do that. Make it funny. Go against the grain on this one. And so she tells me, so a bear attacks me and you're going to come save me. And I say, fuck no, I'm not going to come save you. Bear, are you kidding me? Bears are dangerous, wild beasts. I'll let the bear work on you and I'll just run away. It's a fucking bear you're talking about. I'm not going to mess around with the bear. Um, so I went completely against the grain. And again, for a second, her jaw just dropped. She's like, oh, you did not just say that. Like, that's what she's thinking in her mind. But then she starts laughing. We both start laughing because it's so hilarious. Um, and it's really good. So breaking expectations is huge. In fact, you could just walk into every situation, especially if you're talking to a girl, and you want to make her laugh, everything she says, in your mind, install the filter to say kind of the exact opposite of what she wants you to say. Break every expectation she has for how you should act, and that will make her laugh hysterically. And the final category I'm going to give you is called physical humor. So sometimes you're lost for words, you don't know what to say, you can just be goofy and funny physically. Funny facial gestures, sticking your tongue out, or making some weird face, just randomly out of the blue at somebody, uh, is hilarious sometimes. One thing that I'll do is, um, if I'm in a nightclub, you know, in the nightclubs they have these styrofoam sticks that have lights in them, and they kind of light up, and you can wave them around. A lot of times girls will walk around in nightclubs with these. Sometimes what I do is I'll just grab one of those sticks, and I'll put it down below my belt, like it's my dick hanging out, and I'll just walk around with this big thing hanging, you know, sticking out from uh, from my belt. And I just walk up to groups of girls and I just do kind of like a, a thrusting pelvis motion with this foam stick, and I just say, stroke it. Stroke it. You know you want to stroke it. And so I just, I just kind of like do this jerking off motion. Uh, and it, it gets a variety of results. Half the girls are shocked and offended, and the other half of the girls are laughing hilariously and, uh, and, and a lot of girls will come over and start to actually start stroking it and sucking it. It's hilarious. So just like physical humor like that, um, which is uh, usually context dependent, you can, uh, you can do that too. So one key here that I want you to understand is that humor is highly situational and context dependent. It's not like I'm walking in there with a pre-crafted joke that I'm going to say. It's not like a knock knock who's there joke and you say something funny. That's lame humor. The best humor is situational humor. It's fluid and spontaneous. And the only way you can get that is not by memorizing canned lines, but replacing your filters. When you have the funny filter on, when you're looking for the absurd, the ridiculous, when you're looking for breaking expectations, your mind will get good at finding that stuff. And then when you remove your, your filters for offending people or blurting stuff out or looking silly, then you'll just blurt stuff out and it's going to come out funny. So that's the whole key to humor is those two things. Let me give you one more powerful uh, tip here. I have a question that you can use in your mind to help you unlock the funniness in yourself. Unlocking the funniness. Here's the question. Write this one down. 
what could I say in this situation to make it funny? Again, what could I say in this situation to make it funny? Write that down and ask yourself that one question whenever you want to be humorous. You have to train your mind to be asking that question all the time when you're interacting with other human beings. Um, even in the most mundane situations, like maybe you're at a gas station and you're paying for a bottle of water. It's not funny at all. There's nothing absurd about this situation. It's the most mundane situation. Now in your mind, if you want to practice being humorous, you ask yourself, okay, what could I say in this situation to make it funny? And you force your mind to come up with something funny. Now, here's the trick. When you first start doing this, it's going to seem very hard and it's going to feel, feel impossible in certain situations. You're going to say something like, well, Leo, it's just a bottle of water and a gas station clerk. There's nothing funny about it. That's because your funny filter isn't installed yet into your mind. The funny filter will get installed by asking the question and forcing your mind to come up with answers. It's a training process. What I found is that I literally had to rewire how my whole mind works. Because usually my mind is not looking for the funny. Usually I'm very analytical. You know, I'm, I'm doing some marketing or I'm writing some, uh, uh, some blog post or I'm shooting a video or I'm thinking about some deep philosophical topic. There's nothing funny in my mind that's looking for, you know, for anything humorous. And when I do that for a long time, I forget that humor is even possible. But when I force myself to look for the funny over and over and over again, and it's hard at first, eventually what happens is that my mind starts finding the funny. So now we're getting to the portion of this program where I'm telling you how to actually practice this. This is how you practice it. This is why I said at the beginning, how bad do you want this skill? If you want this skill, you're going to have to go through the emotional labor of rewiring your whole mind. The nice thing about it, though, is that if you do it once in your life, then forever you're going to have that ability to be humorous spontaneously. It's a very powerful ability. So it's worth doing, even though it'll take you some months or years to do. So let me give you a few more tips on how to practice this. I would say this. If you're really serious about it, you really want to fix this problem once and for all in your life. Make it your mission for the next 12 months to look for the funny in every situation you possibly can. Everywhere. Everywhere. With friends, with family, with girlfriends, with boyfriends, with guy friends, with coworkers, every place. Look for the funny. Your mind will get better at it as you make that your mission. And then you do the following three exercises. So, exercise number one. I call it random sentence strings. So here's what you do. For 10 minutes straight, you set a timer. Sit down in a quiet place, alone by yourself. And then for 10 minutes straight, you're going to string together random sentences using the last word in one sentence to then start the next sentence. So I'm going to give you an example right now. So let's start with a random word. First word that pops into my mind is water. Water is delicious for fish. I just made a random sentence in my mind. Now, sounds like a stupid sentence. Water is delicious for fish. I don't even know if that makes any sense. Um, but I just blurted it out with no filters. So water makes no sense for fish. Now, fish is the, the last word in that sentence. I'm going to use fish to start my next sentence. Random sentence. Fish uh, smell like smelly vagina. Okay. Uh, random, just blurting it out, a random sentence. I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, random sentence. Uh, so now vagina is the last word in that sentence. So vaginas are designed to create babies. Nothing funny about that, but I just blurted it out. Babies. Uh, babies are stinky and loud. Nothing funny about it, but I just blurted it out. The last word is loud. Loud nightclubs are annoying as fuck. Blurting it out. Fuck. And then you just keep going. Right? So that's the process. The key with this exercise is that it's not so much teaching you how to be funny, but it's removing your filters those filters that are preventing you from saying funny stuff. You need to get very good at just blurting stuff out and not hesitating. So this exercise will work great for that. So you're going to do this exercise every single day for 10 minutes for at least three months straight. 
And if you're very serious, do it for the next 12 months. You're going to have huge gains if you do this. Second exercise, it's visualizations and affirmations. I'm not going to go depth into depth on visualization and affirmations because I have whole videos that show you how to do that. You can go search for those. But basically, I'm going to give you two visualizations and two affirmation statements that you can use. Very powerful. So how you're going to do this is like the following. You're going to set a timer for five minutes, and you're going to sit down, and you're going to do visualizations for five minutes. And you're going to visualize the following thing. Number one is the following statement. I see funniness everywhere. I see funniness everywhere. You're going to close your eyes. You're going to visualize yourself going through every context in life at work, at home, in the family, at the nightclub, seeing funniness everywhere. You're going to visualize that. You're also going to do five minutes more of affirmations of that statement. So I see funniness everywhere. You're just going to say to yourself in your mind, I see funniness everywhere. I see funniness everywhere. I see funniness everywhere for five whole minutes. Okay? And then the second statement is, I am a rascal. This is a good one. You're going to close your eyes for five minutes. You're going to visualize, I am a rascal in every context of life. Picture yourself being a rascal and enjoying it. And then you're going to do five minutes more of affirmations, I am a rascal. And you're just going to say to yourself in your mind, I am a rascal. I am a rascal. I am a rascal for five minutes straight. You're going to do these visualizations and affirmations for three months straight every single day. Don't dismiss how powerful this is. This is what reprograms your mind. Very powerful. And the final exercise is every situation that you're interacting with other human beings, you're going to look for the funny scenarios in life. Everywhere. Every single sentence that you hear from someone's mouth, you're going to ask yourself the question, how could I make that situation funny? How could I turn what they said and riff on it and make it funny. And you can actually really take this to the next level by practicing on store clerks. So if you really want to practice this with a live human being, what you do is you go to a mall, public mall, go to a department store at the mall like Macy's, go to the Cologne department where they have women or men selling you stuff, and you just start up casual conversation as though you're interested in some cologne, but then you ask her some questions about where she's from and how she got this job and you just start a conversation and then you look for the funny in every single single thing she says. Look for the funny. And you try to riff on it and make her laugh. What's really cool about that is that there's no pressure on you and she has no expectation that you're going to make her laugh and you're going to make her day better by doing that because she's bored out of her mind standing there for eight hours anyways. And um, there's really no risk to you in this situation. So you can go and practice that very easy for free. You can also practice with your friends and your family. If you have a girlfriend, you can practice on her. If you have a wife, you can practice on her. I love practicing this with uh, girls that I date. I'm talking to a girl. If I'm Skyping with a girl because I have a long-distance relationship or something, uh, literally, I'm sitting there and everything she's telling me over Skype, I'm just asking myself in my mind, what's funny about that? What's absurd about that? What could I say that would make her laugh? And my mind just gets better and better and better at coming up with this shit. Until after a few years, it gets really good. And the scales tip, the shift happens, my filter changes, now I've got the funny filter on, and I'm pretty humorous when I need to be. Uh, it's quite remarkable how flexible your brain is, and how much it will adapt and switch filters here. So, believe in yourself as you do these exercises. I'm telling you that if you do this for the next, even just three months, you're going to have significant improvements. And if you do it for 12 months... Uh, you might become extremely humorous, the most humorous person in your entire uh, social circle. Right? So this is extremely powerful, extremely powerful stuff. Don't get uh, tricked into thinking that these techniques are very simple and kind of like lowbrow techniques. You want something more sophisticated. You want more sophisticated forms of humor. No. Start with the most crass, the most basic humor and the most basic techniques here. These techniques, these visualizations, and the other stuff that I told you, this will take you very, very far. All right. Before I go, let me give you two important warnings. Warning number one 
is do not use canned lines. This will kill your progress. What you're trying to develop here is a skill and a rewiring of your entire mind. You're trying to change these filters. Canned lines will not do this for you. If you take the examples I gave you here and you just memorize them and then you go up to girls and you tell them, you might even get a few laughs here and there, but you're not going to develop real humor. You're not going to become a humorous individual. You're going to become a line spouting robot. And in fact, you're going to be nervous when you're spouting those lines because, you know, what if I say the line wrong or what if I run out of lines and you will run out of lines and your lines will also not be context sensitive. You're not going to have a line for every context. So go for the bigger picture goal. You want to develop this skill. This is a very powerful skill that you want to have in life, especially if you're a man. So it's worth doing the hard work to get it. Don't waste your time so much on canned lines. I wasted a lot of my time memorizing canned lines. Um, and uh, it didn't really help me become humorous the way that I wanted. And the second warning I'm going to give you is you have to come at this whole thing from a sense of self-amusement and not seeking validation. So I'm not telling you to go out there and become a clown for the world because the world needs more clowns and because the world needs more humor. No, you're not trying to become a stand-up comedian, nor are you trying to really make other people laugh. That's not your job. What you're doing here is you're developing this ability. You're developing a new attitude towards life. You're going to see life in a new way. You're going to have more playfulness in your life. That's fundamentally what you're doing here, is you're building this kind of playfulness muscle. Because you're way too uptight. You're too serious. That's why you're not humorous. You're not playful. You're not letting yourself go. It's almost like you want to be drunk your whole life. It's like you're so loose when you're drunk. Imagine being that way your whole life, but being sober at the same time. It's not a paradox. This can happen. But you want to come at this from a place of self-amusement. So when you say something funny in a situation, it's not to get a laugh. It's not to get people to like you. It's you expressing your joy for life. That's what it is. Seems subtle, but it's an important distinction. So when you say things or do funny things, it's mostly to amuse yourself. And if other people laugh, great. If they don't, who cares? A lot of times, they'll be offended. They will. That's okay. You have to take that cost. That's fine. A lot of times, they'll think you're stupid. That's okay. A lot of times, I'm the happiest, and I'm laughing the hardest on the inside when I do something stupid, and then people are laughing at me, and I'm kind of like laughing at myself, and I'm laughing at the fact that they're laughing, <laughs> and uh, it, it just like it turns into this kind of like a cycle of self amusement. So it's not necessary even that other people laugh at your jokes as long as kind of like you're amused on the inside. And of course, don't use this as a way to uh, to be mean to people. That's also not what I'm advocating here. Try to make your self amusement work in such a way where you're self amusing, but you're not hurting others in the process. It is possible to do both. You don't need to always be amusing yourself at the expense of others. Right? So just keep all that in mind, follow the exercises, and you're going to have some uh, powerful shifts in how you see the world. All right, this is Leo. I'm signing off. Post me your comments down below. Please click the like button for me. Share this video with a, a non-humorous friend, because we do honestly want more playful and humorous people in the world. It makes the world nicer, more pleasant to live in. And lastly, come check out actualize.org. This is my website right here. Come sign up to the newsletter, free newsletter. I release new content on self-actualization every single week. I'm really passionate about this because I think that this material, these powerful psychological understandings of how your mind works and how life works, when you master these, you can create a life that's so remarkable that it's even difficult for me to articulate it in words how you can potentially feel. You can feel levels of fulfillment and satisfaction and joy and beauty in life to such high degrees that you wouldn't even believe me if I stood up here and talked about it, right? You have to feel it to believe it. I'm really excited about helping you to master your relationships, the psychology of uh, making money, the psychology of uh, 
getting your mood into shape, getting out of your depression, uh, getting the right career into place, finding your life purpose, all this stuff, when you put all these pieces into place, man, you're going to you're gonna savor life in ways that you didn't think life could be savored. It's quite amazing. It's really uh, a beautiful thing. So I want to help you tap into that. And to do that, you need to stay on board with me. This is a big goal. And like they say, you don't get something for nothing. So you will have to work towards it. The good news is that a lot of this content that I'm sharing with you is totally free. It's very deep content. Stick around every single week. Take baby steps. Do the exercise I tell you to do. You'll find that within a few years, your life will transform. You will become a self-help junkie. And your optimism for your future will just blossom. And the things you feel in your life will be remarkable. So sign up, stay tuned, and I'll see you soon.